Thank you, Mark, for being here, and I'm going to pass it over to you. Thank you, Lizzie, and thank you, all of you, for being here. Thank you to the BOGE team for making this happen. And given we have just about 55 more minutes, I want to dive right on into the heart of this, which is, well, I think the heart of it is that as yoga teachers, we care about the quality of our classes. We want our classes to be the best they can possibly be for all of our students who are in them. And one of the greatest challenges that most teachers find in teaching, especially as newer teachers, um, is designing classes that make sense for the students who are actually in them. In contrast to say an abstract class, a, a, a template class, this one sort of format that would be applied to everyone and everywhere. And so the idea here is to try to develop the to, to work towards developing the knowledge and the skills for a lifetime of being able to create classes that make sense for to you for your uh, approach to your students to the uh, style of classes that you teach to the level of classes that you teach, um, and there are a variety of ways that we can that we can get at this. So again, I'm going to start to just dive uh, more or less right into it. And so um, to start, I also want to, in Lizzie's introduction to me, she mentioned that I had practiced Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, and then she said, and lots of others. And the important point in that, in sort of with the lots of others, is that there are very different approaches to the basic question that we find in sequencing, which is, why this, then that? Why this rather than something else? What's the, the rationale, the logic, or the spirit, or the inspiration for the specific ways that we put things together to have a full class, the arrangement of asana of postures, as well as breathing techniques and other parts of an overall whole practice. And in some styles of yoga, there's no such decisions to be made. They've already been made for us in Bikram or 26-2, in Ashtanga Vinyasa, in Sivananda, and some other styles the sequences are already done. And that can be a very beautiful thing if those sequences work for you and for your students. And indeed the repetition that one has in those set sequence classes, rigidly arranged or organization of postures uh, can be a wonderful way of, of, of uh, sort of monitoring and checking in on one's own progress in the practice that by virtue of repetition, that we can get a deeper sense of the refinement of our own experience within those various postures that make up an entire class. I'll try to slow down a little bit here. Um, this all in contrast, these set sequence classes, like I experienced for many, many years in doing first, second, and third series of Stanga Vinyasa, each of those series, the same exact order of postures every day. Um, that's sort of one end of a continuum, if you will, of sequencing from set sequences at the other end is what I kind of playfully refer to as a random creativity. But, and by random, I mean random, like it just comes out of the imagination, which can be, of course, a beautiful thing. You're on your bicycle or driving or however you're getting to teach to your studio uh, that you're going to teach in. Um, and you just kind of on a whim or in your imagination, fancifully and informed by what you know, you come up with ideas for a class. And that might be beautiful. In fact, it probably is. Does the sequence really make sense? Does it optimize the opportunity that you have within an hour or an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and a half to offer your class, your students the very best that you possibly can in terms of a class that makes sense with one posture to the next, helping to deepen the experience and make it a more significant overall transformational experience in doing a yoga practice. And so I love random creativity for myself, like, you know, roll out of bed in the morning or midday, get on my yoga mat and just go with it. Be spontaneous. What a beautiful way to do one's personal practice. And I'll suggest mm, really sort of what a terrible way to go about designing or coming up with a class that you will teach, because I think our students deserve more. And it's important to keep in mind that we are not our students, our students are not us. And irregardless of what you can do or want to do, it might not really be what your students are expecting when they come to a class that's been described in a certain way, a certain style, flow, hatha, yin, restorative, whatever it is, power, whatever it is, um, as well as a level, like 
level one, level two, level three. So your students have signed up for a class, registered for a class, <clears throat> excuse me, probably because, well, they want that kind of experience, level two flow or whatever it happens to be. Is that what they get when they show up? So what I'm going to do now is take you through a process, some principles, sensitivities and principles and specific techniques for designing classes that make sense in terms of the real students, the actual students, your students who are in them, as well as your own sense of it all, your own values and all. I'll be putting a lot of this on this whiteboard so that we can all kind of go along together um, with this. And before I go any further, I want to highlight one important point that a lot of teachers bring to me regarding sequencing. And that is this insatiable desire to have our classes fresh, which they suggest to me, those teachers, that is, that they're hearing from their students in some way, or sometimes it's that they've heard that another teacher is doing something in some way and that maybe that teacher's classes are quite popular. And so we think to ourselves, that teacher might think to, to themselves, hmm, what are they doing? What do I need to do to keep my classes fresh? I want to underline the, the, the value of those set sequence practices like Ashtanga Vinyasa and Sivananda and uh, 26.2 and others, where you do the same exact thing over and over. There's a lot of value in repetition. And even with, rep, with a class that is largely the same from one class to the next, with small tweaks, small revisions from one class to the next, we can keep them all together fresh, along with the reality that we ourselves, our students themselves, are always fresh. We are new and different in every moment. It's called Paranamavada in the ancient yoga literature, the constancy of change. So we change from day to day and practice to practice. That in itself is a vital source of freshness in the experience, even in those set sequence classes. But I get it. We want, our students want, you probably want to be doing things that simply put a different spin out there, to offer a different experience in the specific kinds of postures that you're doing, as well as, I'm gonna go into this a little bit now, the theme of the class. I'll suggest that theming is important. And, and that is, what's the, is there, is there a, a kind of a mood, a vibe, a focus area that you want in a particular class. For example, you might describe a class as a heart opening class in which, well, there are lots of suggestions of what that would mean, but it generally refers to more space through here um, and generally associated with, with backbending and just more kind of emotional opening and release of tension and the heart center and all. And so we might design a class around that as a theme or hip opening, or it could be tied to seasons, such as spring renewal. Um, whatever it happens to be, the theme itself can be an essential part of helping, helping us to frame what the class overall looks like. And then as I mentioned before, along with theme, we want to be very attentive to what is the particular style of the class that we're teaching? Is it, how is it described on the class schedule or on your website or wherever you happen to have your classes uh, uh, advertised? And, and then also, what is the level of the class? So bringing those elements into consideration, I wanna first just offer you a little bit of a playful thought, ex thought exercise here. Imagine you roll out of bed in the morning and you might be familiar with the pose wheel, Urdhva Dhanurasana, upward facing bow, a pretty deep back bend, some would refer to it as an intermediate level back bend. Now imagine rolling out of bed in the morning and without doing anything else, you come into wheel or you try to come into wheel. And for some, that will be very easy. And for others, it will be relatively impossible uh, or, or extremely difficult. But now imagine that you took 30 or 40 minutes in the morning, identifying the parts of that posture where you need more of openness, more flexibility, as well as where you need more stability. And you did some other postures to create those openings and those awakenings or stabilizings. And now, 20, 30, 40 minutes into it, you come into wheel. You've opened up the arm, the shoulder girdle for shoulder flexion, the anatomist would call this. You've opened up to the hips, especially the hip flexors, so that you can more easily extend the hips, which we do in almost all backbending. And you've also done some practices, some postures to help warm and awaken along the spinal column, get more uh, ease of movement through the spinal column and more easily open up to the front body. Imagine doing that wheel now, and it will be altogether more uh, accessible. 
And accessibility is one of the key elements that I want to encourage in designing classes, that we design our classes to be more accessible, while well, suggest safer, more accessible. And by virtue of being more accessible, I will suggest more sustainable. And by virtue of being more sustainable, I'll suggest more deeply transformational, effective in attaining the objectives, the goals, the intentions that most students have in doing yoga, that it affects things, that it changes things, makes them more calm, more awake, more balanced, clearer, all the various intentions that our students bring with them to their classes. So going a little further with this then, and you could substitute wheel for another posture, such as downward facing dog pose, come into down dog without doing anything at all before that. Some of us might thoroughly enjoy that and find it to be a wonderful way to get initially warmed up. Whereas for others, downward facing dog pose, auto mukha zvanasana is a very challenging posture. They have tight hips and hamstrings and their shoulders are maybe tight or weak or whatever it is, it's not so easy. What might they do to make it more accessible, more sustainable? Look at the posture, develop a deeper understanding of it, asking some basic questions about it. I wanna come back to those basic questions after I first give you a little bit more in the realm of kind of theory, basic sensitivities in, in sequencing and principles of sequencing. And then we'll look to apply those and ultimately within the next 35 minutes or so, we will look, we will move towards designing a class. So to start then with this, basic principles of sequencing. Number one, move from simple, can you see this? Darker. Let's go with this. One, simple to complex. So you might imagine again, getting out of bed in the morning and coming directly into wheel. Now consider coming out of bed in the morning or just midday getting onto your yoga mat and come into bridge pose where you might only lift up your hips a little bit and bridge, Satu Bandha Saravandasana, bridge pose. How high do you lift? Maybe only a little. I will suggest that bridge is simply simpler than wheel that reaching the arms back a little or a lot in that bridge pose back bend is much easier to do than this. Add to that, that the hips don't lift up nearly as high and we don't have to have the hips nearly as open in that bridge to have a beautiful, pleasant, beneficial bridge experience. So just to be clear, bridge is simpler and by virtue of doing that simpler posture, the more complex one becomes more accessible. So generally speaking, we want to kind of try generally to arrange postures in some way that's from relatively simple to relatively complex, appreciating that the relative is also somewhat relative to the unique person doing it. Because what might be simple for you is not for someone else and vice versa. Second is to, we want, we are, as human beings, I'll suggest, dynamic beings. That is, we move. And even when we might be, as Eric Schiffman suggests in the subtitle of his wonderful book, Yoga, The Spirit of Practice of Moving into Stillness, that we are always moving in some way. Our heart is beating, I hope, and other things are moving within us. And we also create conscious movements. And those who are really kind of stuck on statically held po poses, if you will, how did they get into them? They moved into them. So the idea is that if we move dynamically, it helps us to gradually warm up. It helps us to more easily feel our way into things on a path towards deepening it, perhaps holding things for longer ways. And indeed, as Eric Shipman suggested, moving um, into stillness. Another aspect is really important is a general principle and sensitivity in teaching we all have different energetics. As you can probably tell, I'm a bit titta. I'm a bit rajastic. I have a lot of fire. I do a lot of practice to calm the fire, to balance it with other energies, if you will. And so I'll suggest that energetic balance is a general goal in every class, a general intention in every class. And it's a bit of a balancing act for us as teachers to suss up, to assess, to sense where the energies are in a class. Is it really high? You might find ways to help settle it a bit. Is it really low? You might find ways to raise it a bit. And then we're ultimately looking 
if look into the prism of yoga theory, it's the gunas theory, um, where we have tamasic energy, very earthy energy. We have rajasic energy, very fiery energy. And little by little, we tame those in a way where we come to more to a sattvic or light quality of being. So looking to cultivate energetic balance, to cultivate energetic balance as a general sensitivity in our classes makes them all together better for our students. Next, this is an idea that comes from a, the, probably the most important yoga influencer of the 20th century, this guy, Krishnamacharya, not just this guy, huge influencer um, with, I won't go into the details of, the, of Krishnamacharya's tradition and all, but he developed the idea of vinyasa krama, which basically means gradual progression. And to be clear about that, one of those words I just used in there, it's an abstract kind of a Sanskrit word, vinyasa. We think, oh, chaturanga up dog, down dog. Or vinyasa, do a transition with connection of breath to movement. Yes, those are examples of vinyasa. Vinyasa from the root word inyasa. Let me get this right. From the root word Inyasa, which means simply to place, to put somewhere, to put into position. And it's prefix vi, which means in a special way. All vinyasa means is to place in a special way. We place our breath and the, the breath and our body mind in a special way. We place our body in special ways to give us alignment. We put energy into our body in special ways to help a, us to stabilize and open up more. And we also put postures, asanas, in a certain order in a special way that gives us a complete sequence. A wise progression, he sometimes would use the word wise rather than gradual, a wise and gradual progression from Wherever you are to wherever you're going, and whatever that path might be, and we'll get into looking at those paths here again in just a few more moments. Fifth, general, general principle is whatever you have done, you started somewhere with certain conditions when you're in, of, of, in it all, and now you're coming out the other side of a practice. How do you feel? Ideally, we feel whole. That there is indeed a sense of wholeness all the way through, even as things can feel fragmented. Our mind can seem distant from our body. We can seem fragmented in our awareness. We can seem con be, feel confused about things. And we can also come to through a, go through a yoga practice and even come out of shavasana and feel stressed out. We might feel stress, tension from things that occurred during that class whether something that was emotional or purely physical, if you will, we feel tension. And ideally, this wholeness that we've experienced towards the end of a class or integration is one that is as free of tension as can be, such that we move out into the world as well, whole as can be. I'm going to erase this if you want to. I don't know if you can do a screenshot. It will be on the recording as well. It's also in my book, it's the same basic principles, although these are updated. Let's say I wrote that book a dozen years ago on sequencing. And so all this is updated after all those years of further learning, which I hope we're all doing together, right? Uh, Aristotle's quip, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. I know a fair amount about sequencing. I realize there's a lot more to know. And here we are learning, I hope, together. Next, getting a little closer now to de actually designing classes. Where do you start? Well, again, start with your own intention, what you're doing as a teacher, the style that you're teaching, the level that you're teaching, the season of the year, and other such general considerations. And so you've already created a little bit of a funnel from here's the magnificent world of yoga, 840,000 yoga asanas, 10 million styles that would seem these days, and you've winnowed it down to something a little bit more focused. And now you're considering a particular class. And I highly recommend that you design your classes with a peak or with some greater practice, multiple peaks punctuating that class. And the peak postures or singular peak or is the starting point for beginning to do some work to make the class overall a coherent, optimally designed one. And getting at this, I suggest drawing what I consider, I call sometimes a 
heat map. Um, this represents time, which I put an arrow there because I assume it continues. And this considers, let's call it relative intensity or heat, warmth, relatively greater in, in, into it all. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you might imagine, well, you would start a class, let's say here, and well, you're going to end the class over here. And here's the door. And oh, there might be another door, or oh, it might be the same door. Oh, the exit door is over there. And some student arrives with a yoga mat over their shoulder and puts it down here and probably comes to sit here. And later on, that same student will be over here, perhaps lying down in Shavasana before, well, going out the door. I think that as yoga teachers, we're interested in what's happening here before that student arrives, their conditions, what's happening in their life. It matters for what they're experiencing in here. And I think we're very much interested in and want to be supportive of what's happening out there. And it, that will also inform what we're doing in here. Our primary responsibility is indeed right here, from there to there. And what we do in there matters and we can get at it in a variety of ways. Now, you might imagine the simple, and I put this in the yoga sequencing text from 12 years ago or so, a simple bell curve, which is one possibility. And in the bell curve, the idea is that as you're progressing along through a practice, this practice punctuated, well, these are yoga postures, asanas along the way, that there is a particular posture. And for our purposes today, we'll focus on a single peak class to make everything clearer. There's a particular posture in that class that we call a peak. And what makes it the peak? It's the relatively most complex posture in that class. It des deserves the most love, the most preparation, the most attention, the most preparation. And that helps us then in better organizing everything else. Now, without going too far with this, I will suggest that for the most part, I'll say in 80% of the classes that I teach, that the peak is a back bend. And I'll explain why in a moment. Now, it could be a deep forward bend. It could be a twist. It could The peak pose could be down dog. The peak pose could be child's pose. Relative complexity for the students who are doing it, consider a range of students from you know yoga therapy, very frail, fragile students with issues in their bones, such as osteoporosis and um, osteoarthritis and other issues to let's say fully healthy functioning, no physical issues, maybe even quite athletic gymnastic students, there is quite a continuum of possibility as to, well, what would make a posture relatively simple? Just, you might think it was weird that I said child's pose could be a peak pose. Child's pose is a deep forward bend with significant flexion rounding of the spine. And if you or your students have advanced osteoporosis, that simple little child's pose can fracture vertebral bodies. Flexion of the spine with advanced osteoporosis can fracture vertebral bodies. When one fractures, it neighbors are likely to fracture pretty soon. And that has very dire uh, um, mortality statistics associated with it. So even child's pose deserves loving attention and how we prepare for it and how we teach it. So again, and that's a forward bend, not a back bend. It could be an arm balance. It could be a whatever. It could be anything. Relatively most complex in your class. And then having so identified this, we want to ask some basic questions about the peak. And this is somewhat informed by Patanjali, uh, Yoga Sutra Patanjali's um, statement. I think it's at Yoga Sutra 2.27 about asana. What is asana? He asks, he says, Stira sukham, asanam, stira, to be stable, steady, stable. And he says, stira sukham, sukham, ease, to be at ease, to be relatively relaxed, relatively tension free. And he says, asanam, from the root word as, which means to sit, to be here now, present in the context of his book, which is mostly about meditation, um, to be here now with stability and ease. And so we ask ourselves, with every asana, that we teach two, well, I'm gonna suggest three basic questions. One, what needs to be open? Think at ease, what, to make it easier, what needs to be open? And secondly, what needs to be stable? I'm just gonna write stable for now and, and a question mark. And this, I'm gonna go into those just a little bit. So what needs to be open? As earlier, I suggested with wheel pose, Urvadhanyarasana, 
the the joint, the, the shoulder joint, shoulder girdle, and, and and shoulder joint within that larger girdle. There are three joints in the shoulder girdle. This movement, I need more openness for this. I need to open up, stretch out the muscles that allow this to happen most easily. There are four basic stretches to give us that shoulder flexion. The first I'll suggest will be a surprise to many. It's this. How does this eagle arms relate to, to this? It's the shoulder blades, the scapulas, allowing them to upwardly rotate, which changes the orientation of the socket in there for the arm such that it doesn't get stuck here, but more easily goes there. And then you can do other stretches such as cow face, to stretch out the triceps and the latissimus and the anterior deltoids. You can do arm extension postures like Proserita C, um, Pyramid C, some would call it, other names it has. Uh, bridge pose itself opens this up. And the fourth stretch is this form in itself, which we can do in uppy dog, down dog, and other forms at a wall. Many ways to do this. Those four stretches in combination help to give us the openness for, the back, for this back bend. We might also ask, what needs to be stable? And, and if it's not clear to you that wheel can be a, a posture with questionable stability, you want another posture where stability is a clearer issue. Think of handstand or Natarajasana, King Dancer, you're in a back bend on one leg with your arms overhead to get to, to hold the other the foot up there behind you. It's a very potentially unstable posture, but I assure you that wheel and indeed every asana has aspects of stability. And so we ask ourselves, what needs to be stable? What needs to be open? What needs to be stable? And then, this is a critical part of this, ask subsidiary questions. That is specifically back to what is, needs to be open. Ask yourself now, what on this theory of simple to complex, what simpler asanas will give you those openings? What simpler asanas will give you those openings? And the same with, stabil with stabilizing. What simpler asanas would give you those stabilizings? And what do you do now? You have an identified those postures and there are so many to choose from, almost infinite possibility. You then make choices about just how you place them on a pathway towards that peak. Now, along the way, and in fact, all along the way, in every single one of those asanas, and especially, well, probably especially in the peak posture, we are creating tension. Every asana creates tension. I used to say, maybe not Shavasana. In fact, I think I used to say, maybe not mountain pose. Well, just stand there for a while. You will feel the tension that some people feel immediately, especially if they have something like a multiple sclerosis or other sclerosis or leg link discrepancy or some other conditions and compression fractures in their spine, as I, some of you know, I presently have from a sustained accident on my property a month ago. So the point of this is that all of the asanas create tension. The third question that we ask is about tension. What tension does the posture, does the asana create? Not just the peak asana, but all of them. And then ask yourself this question. What a subsidiary question on tension. What other asanas will help remove that tension, take it out of you, help you resolve it. Taking that information, what needs to be open and what needs to be stable, identifying those asanas and placing them generally on the arc of your class in preparation for that peak, and along the way, perhaps punctuating it with tension releasing, tension resolving or relieving asanas along the way. Not necessarily after each asana that creates tension, but in certain groupings of asanas, asanas, we do optimally pause or do something that helps to resolve that tension. So it's an integrated practice along the way, and especially so from the peak towards Shavasana, that this is primarily about integration on the path from that peak experience to Shavasana. And to be clear, that heat map for your class might not look like that. It might look like that, much less intense. It might be a multi-peak class. You might get warm really quick and visit a couple of peaks before dropping into Shavasana. What I most highly do not recommend is a class, in which is, which is all too often out, common out there in the yoga realm, a class in which you zip up really high to intensity, sustain it for an hour or so, 
and then suddenly drop into Shavasana, that that's a little bit rough for most people and doesn't allow for the gradual opening and awakening, gradual progression and integration that I'll suggest is essential for long-term sustainable yoga practice. This is about to disappear on three, two, one, and it's going away. I'm going to put some other words up here. We're going to come back to that same kind of a graph in a moment, but I want to put up some other essential fundamental points that relate back to this graph. In fact, I'll go ahead and put the graph up there again. And again, starting with the idea of a basic bell curve shape and appreciating that bell might be shifted more, the, the peak of the bell, the arc could be shifted more over here, over there, could be broadened, lots of different options that will well, reflect uh, your own creativity and ideally informed approach to all of this. Okay, now I come to some basic, more refined ideas about what we'll call the arc, the basic arc structure of a class. One, I, I think in the book I refer to it as initiate the yogic process, which someone sounded to me, it sounded like they were in a chemistry lab or something. Um, think about, well, I do want to again put the word initiation because I think we are taking initiation into our personal practice and just taking a moment at the beginning of a class to get centered, to take a moment, and maybe it's more than a moment, maybe it's five or 10 minutes, depending on the length of the class, the style of the class, the intention of the class, fit. Or you might be standing, or you might be in Shavasana. Lots, yes, starting class in Shavasana. You, whatever form you're in to start, the idea is to arrive, to, have, to encourage, invite your students into becoming more present in the moment, that moment where they are, inviting them into the breath, to conscious breathing, perhaps teaching elements of breathing. And there are so many other possibilities for what one could do here. Read a poem. Um, sing a song. Uh, if you play harmonium and do chants in your class, you might do that, do a brief kirtan, whatever it is. But doing something that signifies that we are beginning a journey, a, a, a chautauqua, a Native American term, a, a chautauqua, a learning journey, that we're going not just into a fitness workout here, but we're taking a journey into ourselves, into our being, into our consciousness, into our body minds, and we want it to be as meaningful, as 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 beautiful as can possibly be. And how do we start that how, or maximize that? Start by getting as initially centered and clear as one can. It's also a wonderful place to introduce basic yoga breathing, ujjayi, to do other pranayama practices to help initiate the entire greater warming and awakening into it all. And that's where we go next to is general, I want to emphasize general warming and awakening. And so with this, there are, again, infinite possibilities for how you would do this. You might have started uh, in a simple cross leg sitting position or in hero of your rasana, it, however you started. Now, that is in a relatively still form, now start to move. What kind of movement? Depends on the class. It might be simple Sufi circles while sitting, spinal twists, lateral stretches, all contributing immediately and directly to the ease of respiration, of breathing, stretching out our breathing muscles, diaphragm, intercostal, sternocleidomastoids, getting us more in, in, in gear, if you will, for deep sustained breathing all along the path. And then it might be cat cows. You might start standing and start with Surya Namaskaras. You might start by pulling back the mats and putting on some, I don't know, uh, Olivia Rodrigo or Prince or something and making some movement, uh, what's it called, uh, dancing. Or not, you might be very purist in your yoga and you start with Surya Namaskara, A, or whatever it is. The idea is to gradually warm and awaken everything. There's general warming and awakening, even as in this general warming and awakening, we're already doing postures that are ideally related to the peak. That in that warming, you already have in your mind's eye, your imagination, your heart, the peak. And you're already doing things that create experiences here that will be showing up later, what we can call anticipatory sets or prefigurative practice. 
three. I'm going to erase peak here so I can fit this in. It's um, now is that we get more fully onto the pathway to the peak. Now, you might be looking at the worksheets to come along with this webinar. And on the worksheets, you'll see. So again, we have the peak pose here. And now what we ideally do is we come back to those questions I posed earlier. What needs to be stable and what needs to be open? To give you a hint about that, in my yoga sequencing book, in Appendix B, B or C, um, it's titled The Constituent Elements of Asana. It's 134 pages. It covers 125 asanas. And for every one of those asanas, it asks what needs to be open, spe specific joints, muscles, etc., and what needs to be stable, specific joints, parts of the body, muscles, engagement. And then for each of those, what simple asanas will give you those openings and stabilizing? If you had my yoga sequencing deck, which has a little booklet with all the theory in it, it also comes with a deck of cards. And the cards on the back of them has all that information. You can't quite see from there, but what needs to be open, what needs to be stable, what tension is created, what other asanas help to resolve that tension detailed information there it's in appendix c or b of that book to help you identify the various possibilities for the postures that are on the pathway to the peak and so now you start to plot those out in doing so in plotting them out i want to suggest one other important resource in the sequencing book it somewhat is reflected in these deck of cards and in the booklet, but not near the detail. It's chapter three. It's basically on family relations, on family relationships, specifically the interrelations of asana families, asana families, standing poses, core, back uh, arm balances, arm support, back bends, twists, seated and supine forebends and hip openers, and inversions, the basic asana families. And so chapter that, so now we ask, what are the relationships between these? Before we get into the relationships between the families, we want to look at the relationships within a family. Take standing postures. How do they relate to each other? How does triangle pose relate to revolved triangle pose? How does warrior three relate to half moon, et cetera? And so in that chapter, it first looks at different types of standing posture. It, within standing postures, it looks at different types of standing postures. Those with the hips in open or external rotation, in closed or internal rotation, in neutral rotation, as well as standing balancing asanas and says, hmm, what makes sense in terms of why this, then that within, within standing postures? And then it says, okay, here's our standing interrelations within it. Now, how does standing relate to core? How does standing relate to arm balances? How does standing relate to all the other families? Next section of that chapter, core. What are the interrelations within core? Why do yogic bicycles, for example, before or after doing windshield wipers? Why? Look, read chapter three. Um, I'm trying to go a bit quickly so we get through more of this within our a lot of time. Um, and, and so it goes. What is the relationship between core standing, core arm balances, core back bends, et cetera? And in this, we also come to see that there are some orderings that don't make sense for how the body functions that is there are some that are i will suggest contraindicated orderings that you do not want to transition directly from here to there for various reasons primarily related to the way the body works and doesn't work what you can think of as practical functional anatomy and biomechanics and so there's a variety of movements that might seem beautifully efficient to get from here to there but when you look at them, kind of analyze the biomechanics, it's like, uh-uh, don't do that. Or be very aware if you have students in your class with certain frailties attempting to do that. Um, and so it goes. There are many other such possibilities for indication and contraindication. A classic one, when you do a lot of strong, deep abdominal core work, if you will, especially that impacts the iliopsoas, especially the psoas that attaches, to the spinal column all along the spinal, the, from L T12 to L5, the lumbar segment, your psoas is attached to the spine right here. Um, tighten up that muscle by working it a lot with something like boat, half boat. And you're, what happens if you tighten up those muscles, your vertebral bodies are more compressed. 
The discs are more compressed, that is. The, the vertebral column is shortened. It makes it more difficult to elongate and arc your spine with forward bends or back bends. So doing deep forward bends or back bends immediately after deep core, not a good idea. Ideally, we neutralize that tension first before we go on to deep forward bends or back bends. This is an example of what would inform your decisions about just exactly what goes there. And now along this path, and I keep the, the sort of metaphor of a path because I think we're guides as yoga teachers. We're guiding students on a path that we've been on before. We know the path. We know where it's more or less difficult. And we can suggest at certain places taking a side trip, such as a visit to child's pose, or taking a side visit to maybe it's a beautiful waterfall that you call handstand. While everyone else is on the main path, you might have some little peel-offs for others in the midst of a practice for different people to be doing different things, a somewhat more intermediate teaching skill, I will suggest. And then you eventually come closer to that peak. And as you get closer to the peak, what have you done? You've opened up and stabilized all of what needs to be open and stable in preparation for that peak, and you've also removed a lot of the tension along the way that will inhibit that peak. And now, ideally, you get a lot of time for a beautiful peak experience, to be able to explore the peak. You did the work, the practice, you showed up, and now you're there. Well, and as you're there, everyone is there, but they aren't there with the same conditions. Some will find the peak more or less easy. Maybe you'll have some variations for them to explore, somewhere further to go. Others will find it entirely bizarre and out of bounds for them. That is science fiction. And you offer them some other practice, X, Y, or Z, whatever that might be. And ideally, it's related to further preparation for that asana, unless there's a reason for them not to do it, like some fundamental contraindication, in which case you offer them yet another path for them uniquely. Beyond that, we want enough time to fully explore the peak giving students the opportunity to try whatever the asana is, perhaps a few times, and then we begin to make that transition that's going to eventually bring us to shavasana. And along the way, I'm going to write a Sanskrit word here. It's from Krishnamacharya. It's called prata kriyasana. Prata means opposite. Kriya means action. Asana means asana. Opposite action is often misinterpreted to mean opposite pose. This is the theory of counterposes. And by counterpose, it does not mean opposite pose. The counterpose for upward arm pose is not a handstand. And the counterpose for a deep back bend is not a deep forward bend. If you go immediately from the deep uh, forward bending of the spine to the deep back bending of the spine, the impact on the inner vertebral discs in between, as well as nerves and other tissues along the spinal column can be highly problematic. First, we want to either just let it be and soak it in and let everything settle and resolve or do something actively to contribute to the resolution of tension, such as after deep back bends or forward bends, simple spinal twists to help release it. Whatever that is, pratic kriya is not about opposite posture, but rather a Opposing the, the uh, tension that's been created through actions in a prior posture. And so what we want to say is then not opposite pose, but how do we oppose the tension that has been created? And that's what largely populates the asanas that populate the path towards shavasana. Ideally, I, I would have my classes in shavasana for at least five minutes. And I appreciate that classes in the modern realm have been, I don't want to say dumbed down, but certainly abbreviated down. Um, back in the day, most yoga classes were 90 minutes and sometimes longer. Uh, my classes in Santa Cruz are 90 minutes and sometimes longer. Um, nowadays, uh, 60 minutes, 45 minutes in a lot of gym environments, online classes, a lot of them I see on YouTube, 50 minutes at the top, short amount of time. You can practice yoga in a beautiful and meaning way in 10 minutes. You can have a beautiful experience. Better to do five minutes of yoga today than none at all, I will suggest. And ideally, we do practice every day. That's a part of the vinyasa krama, of the gradual progression, progression and, the, and, the, um, and the constant placing in a special ways that we show up and place ourselves on our mat every day. So having, at, having time for shavasana is essential, I will suggest, in allowing the integration of the practice. Now, you might put your entire 
spirit into creating a class. You're so super excited about it. And you show up to class to teach it. You've practiced it yourself. You've practiced it with a few friends. You're ready to go with your sequence. You show up and about halfway into the class, you realize it's not really working. That is, it's not working in terms of people aren't getting it. It's not, the vibe isn't right. It's too difficult. It's too easy. What do you do? How do you shift gears in the middle of the path? Well, you start by somewhat forgetting where you had planned to go. It might even be that you're going to have to change the peak. That Maybe you're somewhere over here where you realize, oops, this isn't working. What do you do? You take a pause. You might ask your students to come into child's pose for a minute while you go, hmm, and you consider where you've been. Where you've been could lead to lots of different possible paths. That is, it could be helpful preparation for lots of different paths, given what you're observing. Given where you've actually been, that is what's already relatively open and stable, what does that suggest or inspire about where else you might go? This is, again, kind of a more intermediate teaching skill, thinking on your feet, feeling through your heart on your feet, and using your brain. It's not just the art of sequencing. It's the art and science of sequencing, a very fundamental error if we only look at the art of yoga sequencing. Now, informed by your understanding and feeling about it all, you rechart the class. That uh, I, usually I, when I teach a sequencing workshop, when I travel, like wherever I am, the, often this is a five day workshop all day, every day, five days. Um, my last weekend, this past weekend, I had an in-person teacher training here in Santa Cruz. It's a once a month training. Our entire focus, this entire weekend, this last weekend, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, sequencing, purely uh, sequencing. And we scratched the surface. That's why I have that online 20 hour sequencing course coming up. And there will be more information and there materials from this webinar about that. Rather than going into that here and now, uh, what I'd rather do is with the few minutes that we have before my allotted time ends with you, is any questions, comments that you'd like to discuss, I don't know what's in the chat. I think others are managing that for us here. I'd be very happy to entertain whatever uh, you might have with that. Um, questions yeah, I mean, comments and all hi libby i can Lizzie, i can me. help with that my camera sometimes takes a bit to come back on so apologies if you guys can't see me yet um so just looking there we are we're back Hello. um so for questions i didn't see any specific ones just yet but i did receive an email earlier today and the question is, when we practice sun salutations with lunges, does it matter if we begin with either leg? Um, I don't think so. However, but that is specific. Back up a little bit. Some will insist that you must do one side before the other side in a variety of postures. So that's, and this shows up most with twisting. So you must, some will suggest, twist first to your right under the theory that stimulates movement in the uh, ascending colon. And that then you twist to the left to encourage movement across transverse and down descending colon. And then you talk to gastroenterologists who do yoga and know a lot about yoga and gastroenterology. And they say it doesn't matter. Um, does it really matter? We'd need to hook up an MRI and have you do the twist before, well, maybe inside the MRI machine to really detect that. So now, um, does it matter if you step, if you're doing a lunge pose, if you do the right side or the left side first? Let's just take in Ashtanga Vinyasa, you do Surya Namaskara B, you always step your right foot forward. You always do Warrior One on the, with the right foot forward first. It was a practice developed for teenage boys in the 1920s in India, and they wanted to be very systematic, exactly the same every time for everybody. And they, we went from right to left. And if you look at it physiologically, there's no reason that it needs to be. And so if you're if you are teaching with classical Surya Namaskaras, where they are initiated with stepping one foot back for a low lunge on Janiyasana, well, you step one of the feet back. If when I teach classical, I teach at least two rounds so that on the second round, we initiate by stepping the second, the, the, the opposite foot back initially, because we're both stepping forward and stepping back. From downward facing dog pose and from a low cobra pose from all fours and we want to have the experience balanced out left right whether you initiate with left or right i don't think matters i'm sure there's someone who explained something based on vedic astrology that says oh no no no, you must go with left or right first i'd love to have a conversation with that with you or that person who suggests that 
Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Sure. Quick question about the cards that you showed earlier. Can you quickly detail how to either get them and what they sure. are? Sure. So there's a card deck. It's called the Mark Stevens Yoga Sequencing Deck. You can find it on, online and you can find it online. It takes the theory aspect of the yoga sequencing book, 528 page book. It puts all that theory into this, you know, kind of cute little tiny little booklet, just that little thing. Whereas this is like a 400 page book, the new edition of teaching yoga, by the way, that just came out. Um, but this little thin book has all the theory in it. And it's just, you know, you don't get wrist issues looking at it. It's just a nice little book. And then it has the cards with picture of one on, on the, uh, the posture with its Sanskrit and English names on one side and lots of details on the other. And so you can find those online mm -hmm. for sure. And by the way, the sequencing w seminar w course, 20 hour course that I'm offering starts on May 23rd. It's a one month course has three live sessions, each live session. Well, nine and a half hours of live sessions. We'll design classes together. Um, that goes from the, those live sessions are on Sundays on the 26th of May, the 9th of June, and the 23rd of June. Thanks for letting me put out my advertising information there, Lizzie. Of course. And quick, just follow up with that. We mm. are going to be arranging a 20% discount off of that course. And you will receive that in the email tomorrow with this recording. So definitely, if that's something you're interested in, you'll, you can get 20% off of that um, live programming with Mark. Um, in addition to 25% off the book. Okay, so we'll we'll keep going with a few questions because they have been rolling in. Great. Um, so here's one. What is the difference between simple to complex and gradual progression? Great idea. Great. I, I love it. Um the, in, in certain ways, they they they're mirroring each other. That is, um, and I want to expand, I'll expand a little bit. That is. If we are moving from relatively a simple form to a relatively more complex form, then we are gradually progressing towards something that is more complex. But the gradual progression I want to suggest also is within an asana, within a particular asana. We gradually progress in how we open into it, how we refine within it, how we stabilize within it. And we also, also are gradually refining the very qualities that, with which we apply breath to movement and and. And, and, and opening and stabilizing within a posture. And also very critically, uh, Krishnamacharya's son Desikachar reminds us that it's important to know not only how to climb a tree, but how to climb back down a tree. How do you get out of the asanas? How do you gradually move into them, gradually refine within them and gradually transition out of them? So gradual progression, this vinyasa krama idea relates to more than just the arc of a class and moving in a sort of technical way from relatively simple to complex, but rather gradual progression for Krishnamachari involves, well, that bigger picture, the gradual progression in your practice overall, the gradual progression in your life, and the gradual progressions that we have within a class overall, and the gradual progression that we cultivate within a particular asana. All that said, we overlay that this idea of simple to complex in a particular class, where in a particular class, we try to organize the postures to move from those that are relatively simple to complex. I hope I'm doing justice to that question. I think you are. Okay, so another one will give you about maybe potentially one or two more. My email um, address is mark at markstevensyoga.com. Feel free to send these questions to me directly since we're not going to get to all of them in the next 90 seconds or something. Yes, I'll put that in the chat when you answer Thank the next you. one. Um, so Leanne asks, can you speak further about child's pose and students with, with arthritis? Sure. So arthritis in the, along the spinal column can manifest in different parts of the bony structures, but it's primarily the facets, the facets where the vertebral, uh, where one vertebra moves in relationship to the other vertebra. It's not, well, yes, they're connected by the discs as well, but the, the greater movement occurs at the facet joints. And those joints are synovial joints, they are also covered in, the, the bony structure is covered with cartilage. And much like the cartilage in our fingers, when we develop arthritis, that cartilage starts to wear away and we have more bone on bone pressure. So it goes along the spinal column where osteoarthri osteoarthritis 
is wearing out, wearing down. It is, 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 is indicated by the breaking down of the cartilage and the facets, and that makes movement more difficult. Uh, more, more to put it simplistic, it makes the movement more difficult. On that, by the way, I highly recommend Lauren Fishman's wonderful book, Yoga for Arthritis. Also, his book, Yoga for Osteoporosis, and there's voluminously greater uh, content, information out there on these questions than what Lauren is offering, but those are really good initial primers on both osteoarthritis and osteoporosis. Um, and this is a fun one. We're about uh, at time, but I'm interested to see what you say about this one. So uh -oh. Belle asks, I'm about to practice, teach a group of male athletes who, oh, to a group of male athletes who basically told me they hate yoga. Do you have Love any it. tips? <laughs> yes. Uh, depending on the sport, I would uh, try to find a superstar athlete in their sport. So, for example, if they play basketball, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, until recently the leading scorer of all time, I met first in an Ashtanga Vinyasa class in Santa Monica 28 years ago. He's a consistent yoga practicer, practitioner, still practices yoga, and claims that that's why he was able to have such longevity in the practice. I can give you professional football players, the German national football team, Bayern Munich, a variety of professional soccer teams. Um, I started a program of, in the, with the UCLA athletics department in 2001, bringing yoga to their lacrosse team, their baseball team, the women's tennis team. Uh, and what did they mostly all want, by the way? They don't want power yoga. We often go into working with athletes and oh, they want a power workout. No, they want greater flexibility and calm and relaxation and mental acuity and ability to focus. I think breathing practices, more stretching, restorative practices. They're getting their workouts with their trainers. They don't want necessarily a yoga workout, if you will. And then again, all that said, I would find athletes within that particular sport as inspiration and you will find lots of them if you again i'm a northern california sports fan uh several players on the golden state war will be back by the way golden state warriors uh, we're not done um they they do yoga on a regular basis so do many other superstar athletes today that might provide some inspiration to people who like to look at celebrities for inspiration i love it all righty <laughs> um all of these questions that we didn't get it get to we'll send to mark um but again his email is mark at markstevensyoga.com. Um, dot dot, thank you. Yeah, dot com. <laughs> Alrighty. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Mark, for a wonderful presentation and workshop. It was awesome. Uh, we will send out the recording to everyone tomorrow with all the links, all the codes, and keep an eye out on your email for today um, to potentially win our little giveaway of Mark Stevens' book and a Biogi membership. Alrighty. Thank you, everyone, and we will see you at the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Namaste. Be well.